something uh, a little different. We're going to have a one-off sermon this morning before we jump back into Genesis starting next week. And so we're looking forward to getting back. But I thought, let's talk about something very specific to our times and something we need to hear this morning. Would you just bow your head? Let's pray before we jump into the Word. Father, thank you for your Word again, and thank you for this time in it. Lord, I'm praying that you would help me to handle it rightly, that you'd help us to understand it rightly, that by your Holy Spirit you'd help us to apply it rightly. And Lord, I'm praying that as this topic is just so pertinent to our day, so important for the body of Christ in our community, I pray that we would take it to heart, that we'd live it, and that we'd walk in it. And so we just pray for your help this morning, Lord, in this. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning I want us to take a look at James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. We're going to look at that together because I want us to be challenged by what James calls the sin of partiality. And this really struck me over the last couple of weeks as I've been discussing with other pastors about the things going on in our churches and wanting to serve our churches well. And so this topic came to mind. Or maybe another way of putting it, rather than the sin of partiality, we would call it the sin of favoritism, particularly in our church gatherings. I think this is an important subject that we really need to hear from the Word, to be reminded about this morning, especially in times when churches face divisions, strong opinions, making distinctions among ourselves uh, in these days that God Himself does not make among us. R.C. Sproul defined partiality by saying this, Partiality is when we look at another based on status rather than soul. Partiality is when we look at another based on status rather than soul. You see, we as fallen creatures, we make outward distinctions all the time with one another, don't we? We show partiality more often than we think. We are impressed, generally, by wealth and power and position. We often find ourselves drawn to the person with the good looks, the social status, maybe the nice cars, maybe the fame, maybe the talented, the clean, the popular, the non-awkward. We often gravitate towards and show favoritism towards those who are more popular than us or maybe hold the same political opinion as ourselves. And we judge based on many outward attributes. But God is not like us. God is not like us at all. God is not a God that shows partiality or favoritism. As a matter of fact, when I was walking through the different scriptures that talk about this subject of favoritism, partiality, um, there's a lot of those passages in Scripture about God, how He does not show partiality. He's, he does not judge or discriminate based on outward appearance or physical traits. He does not care what sort of car you drive, what kind of clothes you wear. He doesn't care um, about your physical appearance, uh, what job you have, how many likes you got on your last Facebook post. Those things are insignificant to God. They do not move God in any way they are against, it's against his very nature to do so. He's not swayed by these things. He's not enticed by these things. Not like we are. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, we read, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribes. I find it interesting that when Moses here is describing the greatness of God, how awesome He is, how magnificent He is. And He goes through His might and His greatness, and He's a God of gods and a Lord of lords. And as a description, as an attribute to justify that saying, He said he's, God is not partial. God is not partial. He cannot be bribed. God is not influenced in His judgments or His decisions or even His salvific work based on outward physical traits or status. He cannot be bribed or impressed by you. He cannot be bought off or influenced. He judges without being a respecter of persons. In fact, when God chose Israel to be His people that He would lead, He says in Deuteronomy 7, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured 
possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. See, God is not, did not look at Israel and say, I like their culture or I like their beards. Uh, they, they're, they are impressive. There are many of them. He didn't say any of those things. They, they, they were not impressive to him. Instead, he says, I chose to love them. I chose to bestow them my love and to put my treasured, to make them my treasured possession out of all the peoples of the earth simply because I chose to love you. It wasn't because he was partial. It wasn't because of anything he saw in them. He chose to love. And that's a really important thing. I've said it before, and I'll say it again in, in an off-the-cuff moment. God loves us because God is loving. God loves us because it's who he is. He has chosen to bestow love, not because he was partial to us in any way. God does not show favoritism. On the other hand, in Jude chapter 1, we see the description of ungodly people. And after many strong rebukes, God says this of the ungodly person. He says, They are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They're loudmouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. So there seems to be, in Scripture, as we walk through it, there's many more. In Scripture, there's this picture of of, of the clear problem of partiality, to judge based on status or appearance and to favor them over those who are less is a sin. And even our passage today will say as much. What we do see God doing is judging people based on the heart, based on the heart. He looks inside each one of us and he judges. It is the heart that is the true measure In 1 Samuel 16, God encourages Samuel. We're reading this with our children right now, 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel 16, God encouraged Samuel, the prophet, saying in regards to Saul, who had just sinned against the Lord. He didn't listen to the Lord when the Lord commanded him. He says, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so if you were to look at Saul, if you and I were to look at Saul, we'd say, wow, that guy is pretty impressive. I might want to know him. I want to get close to him. But he says, don't look upon him. God says, I have rejected him, and I look on the heart. Saul's heart had become prideful, rebellious toward the the Lord. He did not obey God when God commanded him, and God saw that heart and judged him, and he took away his throne, and he gives it to David instead. So we as fallen creatures, we show partiality. God does not. We're impressed by looks and status. God is not. And thank goodness He isn't, by the way. Thank goodness that God is not showing partiality. Could you imagine if God went around judging and saving people based on certain outward qualities or statuses? I mean, what if He only saved those who were rich? What if He only saved those who dressed in nice ties on Sunday? If we were to look at all these qualities that we typically look at, if that was the case, many of us would be rejected. So thank God He does not judge with partiality or save based on favoritism. For where would you and I land if that were the case? With God, we all stand in the same level field. And that's important. One of the great images of our judicial system, um, I believe... Is, it's in the States for sure, but one of the great images of the judicial system is this woman whose eyes are covered and made blind while she holds a scale in her one hand. And the sentiment is this, Lady Justice cannot see your status, cannot see your wealth, cannot see your looks, cannot see your power. She cannot behold your riches and looks. She does not want to know what job you have or how likable you seem on the outside. It doesn't matter if you're the President of the United States or you pack bags at a grocery store. Every person is judged equally under the law. Lady Justice doesn't care. She can't see you. And that's how God sees it. He will judge us all equally. He does not care who you think you are. God is not bribed by status, 
But rightly, he judges the heart. He looks at the soul. That's how God judges. And so with that in mind, I want you to ask yourself, is it therefore appropriate that when we gather together, that we make distinctions among one another in that way? We honor some and not others. We welcome some who fit our description of great and reject those who do not with no regard for the heart. To parse one another into camps and outward distinctions rather than faith in Christ. I think our gatherings cannot be full of community snobbery. And for that, I want us to look at our passage because James is addressing that in James chapter 2. It's very important that we understand it. So let's start by walking through this verse by verse. James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. He says, My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So first of all, I want you to look here at that phrase, my brothers. There is an endearing term here, my brothers. He's saying this with this relational love for the people in his church. He intends to speak to them tenderly from the heart as he's about to kind of rebuke them for the sin of partiality. And indeed, we must bring this back to the heart. When we're talking about these things, we're talking about one another. We're talking about relationships in the church. We want to walk together as a family of God if we desire to be a community in relationship with one another and show no partiality. Then love must be a defining ethic between us. And so he says, my brothers. And from that place of relationship and community, James says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory. In other words, as we as Christians behold our God, we just sang about that, as we as Christians behold our God and we look at Jesus and as we have beheld His glory, as John 1 says, and seen His ways, it is totally inappropriate that we should show partiality because it is a contradiction to behold God and His ways and then show partiality. You cannot have faith in Christ and have favoritism among yourselves and welcome only those who you like the most in regard to status or appearance. You cannot behold God and then deny His nature by showing partiality. We must welcome one another. We must welcome one another. Just consider for a minute soteriology or consider salvation. God has chosen to save both the poor and the rich the weak and the strong, the wise and the unwise, the Jew and the Gentile. God has saved from every tribe, nation, and tongue. God saved the wicked that we would, and, and those in our human eyes who we would say are less wicked. So as we look around this room, and as you look at one another, consider even the body of Christ that's been brought together here. Do we not see a wide swath of backgrounds? Do we not see a wide swath of convictions and strengths and weaknesses? Do we not see represented here an example of how God has saved with impartiality? We're not all the same. He's no respecter of persons. He's saving people from every corner of life. From every corner of life. So as we consider the ways of God Himself, consider the wickedness that it is when we start to make certain status distinctions and welcome only some that fit our favorite list and then deny others. Keeping in mind that this is about status and outward physical traits rather than the heart itself. When we gather, we must be willing. We must be willing to join hands and honor each other in the Lord without partiality, just as God has done for us. Romans 15, 7 says, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. You've been welcomed by Jesus. They've been welcomed by Jesus. Therefore, who are we to reject our master servant who he has already welcomed? There are reasons to divide in churches. We never want to see division. But there are reasons to divide. Truth can be one. You can divide over truth. We won't want to be in a place where we give up all truths for the sake of unity. 
It's naturally a sword that can divide. Also, the heart showing up in unrepented wickedness can be a reason to divide. That's what spiritual discipline is all about. Someone who is unrepentant in their sin and they're doing damage to the body and we move them out. And this is why God judges the heart. But to be a respecter of persons, to welcome one because of status and impressive outer qualities versus rejecting another due to unimpressive outer qualities or qualities we don't like is a deep sin, actually. And we must be on guard for it. So at this point, we need clarity. We need examples. What's the difference between showing partiality and judging the heart? What does it look like to show partiality in our gatherings as Christians? Well, thankfully, James gives us an example. Let's look again at James chapter 2, now verses 2 to 4. Verses 2 to 4. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So here's an example that James gives of a rich man and a poor man. And this is in regards to a church gathering. The rich man comes in. He's wearing fine gold rings, as was the custom of many uh, Jewish men at the time. I, I guess wearing rings was actually a very popular thing for status. In fact, there's some evidence that there was places where you could rent rings and walk around with them for a while, showing off your status, and then go take them back. And so the rich man, looking good, smells good, probably was high status in regards to a job or position, comes in. And he is immediately ushered to the best seats. I don't know what those are anymore in church. They used to be the front row. <laughs> the seat of honor. Just like the Pharisees are said to have enjoyed the seat of honor in the synagogues. And at the same time, if a poor person walks into your gathering, they look dirty. They don't smell very good. Maybe they're covered in cat hair. You don't like that. They're dirty. They're smelly. They're wearing clothes that don't fit our liking. We brush them aside and tell them to go sit in the corner away from the rest of us. We've shown favoritism. We've shown partiality at that point. I remember uh, a while back, actually, I'm going to put Joe Rio in here for a second. Joe Rio a while back said, people who come into our midst who are poor, who are suffering in those ways, they keep us honest. They test us to show where our hearts truly are. They keep us honest that we are one body together versus showing partiality. So if we welcome and honor one, whilst dishonoring the other based on status and appearance, then we've shown partiality. We've not said, both, please come. Come and receive from the grace of the Lord. Come and be a part of this gathering and this community together. The reality is that both are sinners and both need to be saved by Christ equally. So James rightly tells us here that when we do such things, have we not made distinctions among ourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? We start to parse each other out into different camps. And we start to do this where we, we, we start to put each other in these different zones of thought and become judges with evil thoughts. Can't believe them. Why would they do that? Why aren't they like me? Why don't they see the way I see? Such distinctions are not to exist. God did not make such distinctions when he saved us. And he commands that we do not make such distinctions now. The evil thoughts that make such judgments and distinctions are like wanting to appear maybe more impressive if I hang out with the right people, wanting to seem more important, wanting to gain favor and power or selfish gain. Or maybe we're simply valuing status ourselves. Maybe we're pressing a particular ideology and are forming camps that are not biblical truths. Partiality is not a humble position. It's a proud one. And God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So instead, we are to be one body. Each one of us, bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, co-heirs of the kingdom, brothers and sisters in the faith, sons and daughters of the Father, we are equally sinners saved by grace, 
The foot of the cross is level ground, and we all worship there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given one Spirit to drink. Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor, Greek, or nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is what we're called to be, one body, together, one in Christ. Some churches wrongly make those distinctions through history. They make these sorts of favoritisms and partialities. It was wrong in those days, too, for the Christians to make a distinction, let's say, between the Jew and the Gentile in terms of status. They love to bug each other. It's in the history books. You can see the Gentile and the Jews fighting each other and insulting each other all the time. Jews would look down on the Gentiles. Gentiles would look down on the Jews. In Christ, that dividing wall is smashed, Ephesians says, and they're no longer just Jews and Gentiles, but rather they're brothers and sisters in Christ now. This today looks like maybe race and nationality. The church is made up from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. No partiality can be shown even between our nations if a church only favors one over the other, it's in a wicked place, not keeping up with what the Lord is doing. There are other partialities and distinctions that we can sinfully make. As was said, you have the rich and poor. Sometimes we're impressed by the person in the church with lots of money, a good job, is thought well of in the community. We want to hang out with them more. You have the race issue, as I said. You have man and woman. If we honor one and not the other, we make wrong distinctions. These are just some of the ways we can show partiality. But can I make another application that I feel is going to hit us a little more between the eyes this morning? How about political distinctions? I know that one's politics are often tied to beliefs. And at some point, the truths we believe and preach are important, and they affect our politics. However, have we not, in our politically divided world, starting making political distinctions within the church? Have we not been bringing the political distinctions into the church? We sometimes wrongly connect our political nation with our spiritual kingdom of God. And they're not the same. I think that's especially true in the States. You see a really strong connection that if God is going to win, that means the United States is going to win. And we could think the same way in Canada. They're not the same thing. Nations rise and fall all the time. As Christians, we certainly hold the role of being preservatives of truth and goodness in any nation as salt and light. But in the end, as Christians, our only politic is Christ and His kingdom. Should not King Jesus be our politic? Should that not be ultimately where we land. So I asked myself this last week, and I'm saying this very carefully, <laughs> what would I rather have? Would I rather suffer, and I do mean suffer, under a communist regime, if it meant that the gospel would flourish? Or would I rather be free and see the nation spiritually dead? What would I rather have? Well, what I would rather have is a free nation where the gospel is free to go and is flourishing. But oftentimes in history, that's not the case. It's a little bit what Joe said at communion. We have everything we need. Why do I need the gospel? Why do I need Jesus? Why do I need to hunger for anything he has to give me? In China, in many parts of Asia, though they're under the suffering of a horrible government, the gospel is exploding. Souls are being saved. People are desperate for a better king than the communist regimes that oppress them. Whereas here, there are people in our nation who are just spiritually confused and dead. What would I rather have? So I go, I'm, I'm like, God, you are sovereign. Where you're taking us, you are sovereign. I don't want our nation to go that way. I don't want it to head that way. But what are you doing with the gospel? How are you going to move it forward? What's it going to look like? I don't know. I don't know. 
Do I want my children and my grandchildren to suffer under bad government? No. No, I don't. But do I want them to be saved? Yes, more than that, I want them to be saved. We make political distinctions in politics. I'll just say this, a few years ago, before the pandemic started, China opened up a little window for the Gideons to go in and hand out Bibles. And at the time, I was really wanting to go to China and hand out Bibles. And so I was preparing for that, and then I got uh, a health issue that hit me, and I thought, I don't want to be in trouble health-wise in China. (laughs) So we didn't go. And then I think that window has closed. But at the time, we were giving out Bibles by the bushel, and I saw the videos. They'd walk into a church, and nobody has a Bible. Not a single person had a Bible, and they'd open up the box with the Bibles in it, and the whole crowd, the whole church, imagine all of you running to the front, and they're pushing each other and kicking each other and moving each other out of the way, and they're grabbing a Bible. And the, the translator asked, why are you being so, so hard to get this Bible? Why are you pushing each other to get a Bible? And she said, because this is our hope. God is our hope, and we don't have one. There was this desperation for God. So we make distinctions in politics. We show partiality between one another based on political leanings. And our only ethic as Christians in our gathering, okay, you have your personal politic, that's great, but in our gatherings as Christians, Christ, His gospel, our King, that's our ethic, that is our politic here. And so there's one modern day partiality in the church that is emerging that I think is deeply sinful among us. And I say this with much sincerity. We are making in our day this distinction, vaxxed and unvaxxed. And I'm not talking about safety. That's another conversation. That is a different discussion. A healthcare discussion between you and your doctor. But what has happened is that we have let a health decision become a social distinction and status, haven't we? We've done that. We've let a health decision become a social distinction and status. And that has bled into the church where we've seen people dividing, not welcoming one another based on their vaccine status or opinion. And I have seen vaccinated folks attack unvaccinated folks, calling them a danger. I've seen unvaccinated folks calling vaccinated folks fearful and who would shed the vaccine on them. We've made this a status of persons calling each other um, calling each other a part of the problem. And I ask you, should this be among us, brothers and sisters? Should this be part of how we function here as a gathering, vaxxed and unvaxxed? Never in the history of the church has that ever been a prerequisite for coming to church. Never has that been a prerequisite for being invited to worship God and be in community who God has welcomed and loved, we are to welcome and love as well. Just look at what James says next. And this is going to unpack now what James says is the answer to these partialities that we make. Verses 7 through 11. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones you oppre- who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the, law, the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now there's a lot here to discuss, but we're not going to get to every detail there. But I'll just say there was also a problem of people showing partiality in the law. This law is less important than this law, so I'll follow this one and not that one. And he's saying, you break one, you break the whole law. And so there's no parsing it out. I'm sure we do that today in many ways as well. 
But I want to get to the main point. He brings us back here in verse 8. What is the answer to the issue of partiality? It's what he calls the royal law, God's law, the greatest of commands next to loving God. It's love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. God bids us to love our neighbor, not only a certain select persons. He commends to us both the alien and the enemy, and get this, all who in any sense may seem contemptible to us. Whatever distinction or partiality you've made in your hearts between people in your church and in your church gatherings, we need to exchange that today for the ultimate ethic, to love your neighbor as yourself. Thus, think about how, how would you like to be loved. Think about how one could show you love. If you desire to be respected and welcomed and treated kindly, then do that with one another. If you want to be cared for and protected, then do that for one another. If you desire to be spoken the truth to with sincerity and gentleness and love, then do that to one another. If you wish to be welcomed and invited in as part of the greater community of Christ, just as Christ has done, then do that with your neighbor because we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. God looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. So I ask you, I ask us among one another, how is your heart today? Are you defiant? Are you bitter? Are you afraid? Are you not trusting in God? Are you angry and unforgiving? If you find yourself making, do you find yourself making divisions and rejecting people on grounds that God has not rejected people for? Then it's time to ask the Lord to forgive us and to help us to forgive others. Is your heart's desire to walk in truth? To be obedient to the Lord and to love God by worshiping Him with your life? And is your heart loving towards God and your brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what status they hold? Today, I want us to do a heart check. I want us to do a heart check. Think of that person among us that you've had the most trouble loving, that you've had the most trouble with over these last couple of years, let's say. And I want you to ask, how will the Lord be judging your heart today? What do I need to do to repent, to make things right? What do I need to do to not show partiality? And finally, James' answer to partiality isn't just love your neighbor, it's to show mercy in your judgments as you have been shown mercy. James 2, 12 to 13, our final verses. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This means that as those who have been shown mercy, as Christians who have been shown mercy, as those who know that if we were to stand before the judgment of seat of Christ without any mercy, we would be condemned. As those who know that apart from the mercy of Christ, we would not stand before Him let us show the same mercy that He has shown to us to one another. May we not exclude the generosity of the Lord through over-severity. Let us not show favoritism and dishonor others with a lack of grace and care. Because the warning here is that if we do not show mercy and forgive, welcome one another as God has welcomed us, then we will not be welcomed or shown mercy by God. Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. This all reminds me of that parable of the unforgiving debtor in Matthew. If you remember the man who was to give, who had owed a big debt to the king, and the king forgave his big debt. But then when that man left, he wouldn't forgive the small debt of the one who owed him money. And the king, having heard of this, takes the man that he showed mercy to and he punishes him for that wickedness. And I think the same way. We're going to stand before God one day and be judged. We'll be shown, will we be shown mercy because we showed mercy? Or will we be judged for showing partiality with a merciless heart? Matthew 5, 7 tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So I want you to ask yourself, have we made any wicked judgments 
Have you and I made any wicked judgments that we need to deal with going into the new year? How have I shown partiality and created distinctions among us? When is it when I will come to the church gathering on a Sunday and take my eyes and my pre-service and post-service conversations off of COVID, off of politics, and onto the Lord, where we'll discuss the Scriptures together and the things the Lord is doing in our lives? The glory of God that we have beheld together. May we welcome one another as God has welcomed us through the death and resurrection of His Son. I want to end today by reading from Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. And so I'm going to ask if you could close your eyes, maybe just to listen as I read, maybe absorb its admonishment to us. Romans 12, 9 to 21. Just listen to what we are called to do and be. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible... So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with, with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overwhelmed or overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What a great section of Scripture for us. Showing honor to one another, serving one another, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, constant in prayer, showing hospitality to one another, which means we can't be partial. We have to be willing to welcome one another as God has welcomed us. Let us not let the world and the way it's functioning be the way we function. Let's not let the world dictate to us how we treat one another. Because as it eats itself up, we have a reason, we have an example in Christ to not be there, to do something different, and to show the world a different way forward. I'm going to ask the worship team to come as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this challenge from James 2. It has many applications and many places where it fits into our, our lives. Father, I'm praying that you would bring to mind the ways that we have shown partiality. I'm praying that even in the most obvious ways that our culture is doing, and I pray that we would not show partiality, but that we would encourage one another towards the altar of Christ. We'd encourage one another onward to this community, and, and in this community with our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. So help us together. Help us together, Lord, to, to love one another, to be a, a tighter community, and to heal from some of the things that have gone on over the last two years. Holy Spirit, we need your help in that. Help us to sort out the messiness of it all. But Lord, just like our passage says, would you just fill our hearts with a love for one another and a desire to show mercy. And I pray that that would be strong in us, that it would be a work of the Holy Spirit in us. And that our community would grow from that. So we thank you, Lord, for your impartiality in saving your people. For choosing to bestow your love, not because of anything you found in us, but because you have chosen to bestow your love on us. Through your Lord Jesus, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.